My name is Sean Smith. I'm an executive vice president at Porter and Valley. I lead our corporate reputation practice. I've had the privilege of uh, being in this role for the last nine years where we help our clients all around the world and across every sector to proactively uh, establish a reputation that is built on trust and goodwill and reputation equity that allows them to meet their financial objectives and their business objectives. Um, we are going to um, hear from one of my colleagues at Porter Novelli, uh, Andrea List, who is the vice president um, in our analytics and research function. She is going to walk us through some work that is recently out of the field, uh, as well as um, convey some underlying research that Porter Novelli has uh, conducted over the years uh, on consumer expectations um, for brands around purpose. And we'll talk about this link between purpose and financial performance. And then we will um, have uh, a discussion with uh, our two very accomplished panelists, uh, Tom Crohan, who's a vice president and counsel uh, for corporate responsibility and government relations at John Hancock. Tom oversees the company's corporate responsibility strategy, which includes sustainability and community investments and employee engagement initiatives. Um, prior to joining John Hancock, Tom worked in politics for um, the late U.S. Senator Edward Kennedy uh, for eight years uh, from Massachusetts. And we also on our panel will be joined by uh, Trissa Thompson. Trissa currently is a, an advisory board member for Pledgeling Inc., a software company based in Los Angeles that offers technology solutions that engage customers, employees, and partners in your social impact. Um, he is also an advisor to Plan C uh, Advisors, which is a global consultancy helping boards of directors and CXOs navigate climate-related business issues. Porter Novelli is a proud partner um, with Plan C Advisors. Helps. Trista also serves on the board of the Green Electronics Council, which is an organization dedicated to ensuring uh, the use of sustainable technology. Cannot wait to moderate a conversation with two of you and really hope to take questions from those of you who are logged into the session. There is a chat function over there. Thank you to those who were trying to communicate to me that I was on mute a minute ago. Uh, I will be uh, looking now more directly at the chat and cannot wait to integrate your questions into the conversation. But first, let's start with uh, Andrea, um, who can kick us off by talking about Porter Novelli's Purpose Premium Index. Andrea? Great. Thank you, Sean. Reputation, quite simply, is everything. It is the lens through which consumers weigh purchasing decisions the prism potential employees use to evaluate job prospects, the filter businesses implement when selecting partners or vendors, and of course, it's the primary trigger in when and how to invest in a particular company. It's the foundation of a brand and core to the success or failure of a company. It is painstakingly built and carefully protected, yet can implode in a moment. In short, every reputational point matters. But how do you accrue those reputational points and what role does purpose play in building your reputation? Let's find out. I'm excited to present the 2020 Porter Novelli Purpose Premium Index. This is our third annual study that looks at the role purpose plays in contributing to a company's overall reputation or what we like to call the purpose premium. We faced a tough question this year as to whether we should continue to field our study during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic and social unrest in our country. But ultimately we decided that we needed to understand 
how the pandemic and cultural social movements of this moment would impact companies' reputations. We knew we would see changes in how companies performed. Some companies would falter and others would rise to the top. And we were right. There was a lot to unpack this year. But just as important as what has changed in 2020 is what hasn't changed. Unequivocally, consumers are mandating that companies lead with purpose and positively impact society. So we'll dig into this a bit more later on, but it's worth noting that expectations for purpose didn't wane throughout the spring and summer when we were all learning how to navigate this new normal. And if anything, companies who leaned in on their purpose were rewarded reputationally, as we'll show you. But first, let me give you some background on how we build the Purpose Premium Index. Each year since 2018, we've surveyed 6,000 American adults to understand their perceptions of Fortune 200 companies. Consumers are asked to rate these companies on over a dozen reputational attributes. To understand how these attributes contribute to overall reputation, we performed a factor analysis to determine a more succinct set of reputation pillars. And these pillars are quality, vision, and purpose. And finally, we've been benchmarking the degree to which each of these pillars makes up reputation and how companies are performing within each. 96% of a company's overall reputation is derived from attributes that fall into these three, killer, three uh, key pillars of quality, vision, and purpose. And it's the purpose premium that drives 14% of a company's overall reputation. So I know 14% can seem small, especially when compared to the two thirds of reputation that's made up by quality. But when it comes to building your reputation, like we said, every single point matters. And purpose can often be the boost that lifts one company reputationally above its peers. And consider this, we found an 88% correlation between purpose and reputation, 88%. That means these two factors, purpose and reputation, very much move in sync with one another. So as purpose goes, so does your reputation. And if that isn't enough, we've also found when taking a look at corporate financial performance, that purpose-driven companies are actually worth more than other companies. The top one-third of purpose-driven companies outperform the bottom two-thirds in year-over-year -year stock price appreciation between 2019 and 2020. And this year, we took it one step further. In 2020, we decided to look beyond just the average consumer and look at a subset of investors. So you recall off the top of the presentation that I said there was an unequivocal consumer expectation that companies lead with purpose. So we see it here too with investors. Nearly all say it's important for companies to be purpose driven. Three quarters say it's not enough to just make money. Companies have to positively impact society as well. And more than eight in 10 believe purpose driven companies will outperform those that don't lead with purpose in the long run. So this tells us it's not just consumers, but the all important investor stakeholder who understands the purpose premium. Now that I've walked you through the macro view of the Purpose Premium, I want to take a deeper look at some of the individual companies that did well in purpose and reputation in 2020. It's important to remember that these rankings are representative of the minds of consumers. So consumers don't always see things by strict definitions of sustainability or responsibility. Much of their perceptions are shaped by how they interact with these companies and what they read or see in media. And of course, we'd be remiss if we didn't think through how the pandemic has affected the purpose premium. Specifically, we asked ourselves this year, was there a good bump? 
So what we mean by this is the degree to which companies and brands are getting a COVID halo because they are now providing essential services to Americans. We've seen in our ongoing series of COVID-19 purpose trackers that the food and beverage industry has performed well as one of the top industries doing a good job providing COVID relief and support. We also saw this from technology companies. So during the pandemic, this ability to buy food in bulk becomes critical and streaming movies and shows at home is the lifeline. So we did indeed actually see this COVID bump in a couple of our high performing companies. And I think you're starting to get a sense of where I'm going with this. Costco and Netflix were two companies with strong improvements overall in purpose attribute scores. So we'll take a look at them, as well as some more traditional purpose-driven companies also in the food and beverage and technology industries, Microsoft and Starbucks. For each of these companies, we'll look at which attributes of purpose, whether it's responsible, caring, advocate, environmental, or philanthropic, which attributes were strongest and how that contributed to their overall purpose premium. First, Costco. Costco Wholesale was rated highest in the attributes of responsible and caring with scores in the sevens out of 10 total for three of the five pur purpose attributes. In comparison, in 2019, Costco was rated 6.68 for responsible and 6.65 for caring. So these are huge jumps that we're seeing in 2020. And we see this playing out in how their legions of super fans are talking about Costco. The media share articles about why consumers are obsessed with the brand and how little kids want Costco themed birthday parties. And this became even more acute during the pandemic when buying in bulk was a necessity. Costco also took early safety precautions mandating masks for all customers to keep both their employees and consumers safe. But we also learned when looking a little bit deeper at Costco that this is a company whose leadership lives their purpose through caring and responsibility. The CEO is paid only a third of what the average CEO salary is and truly, truly believes his employees are the heart of the company. So this comes through and how employees treat their consumers and how consumers are fiercely loyal to this brand. Costco is quietly living its purpose and also shows up in other ways with sustainable products, sustainability requirements of its vendors, and philanthropic support in its local communities. But their purpose really comes through in how they act and interface with consumers and employees. Next, we look at Netflix. And I think we probably all got a little cozier with our Netflix subscriptions this year. I know I did. And responsibility was once again at the top of purpose attributes, just like it was with Costco. But we see advocacy in the number two spot. This score was up from 6.75 in 2019. And it's probably clear to anyone who spends a lot of time watching Netflix programming that its support and diversity of its talent are what is front and center. It's one of the few places in entertainment where you can see diversity, equity, and inclusion literally play out on your screen. And Netflix has also stepped up early to provide support for entertainment workers who lost their jobs during the pandemic. CEO Reed Hastings made a $120 million contribution to HBCUs and yes, this was Reed's own money. This was not a Netflix contribution, but what it shows is his support for racial equity comes through not only in how he lives his life, but in how he runs Netflix. So now we turn to some more traditional purpose-driven companies. Like Netflix, Microsoft was strongest in responsible and advocate dimensions of purpose. Both scores were up slightly from 2019, 
And this really shouldn't come as a surprise, especially as Microsoft has spent millions of dollars on Super Bowl ads over the last couple of years, whether it's showcasing its adaptive Xbox controller for gamers with disabilities or featuring Katie Sowers, the first woman to coach in a Super Bowl. So Microsoft doesn't just use the Super Bowl as a platform to tell its purpose story. They also live it through its own DE&I goals. It's a company that embraces diversity throughout its global workforce as much as it celebrates it in others. It pushes for equality in its own local market philanthropy and has made bold moves in sustainability as well. Just recently, Microsoft made headlines for buying sustainable jet fuel to cut CO2 emissions on all of its corporate travel. And once again, we see another company strong in advocacy and consumers are taking notice. And finally, Starbucks. This has long been a company that's received plaudits for leading with purpose, but its attribute rankings look a bit different from the last three companies. So instead of responsible and philanthropy leading the list, uh, we see, uh, or excuse me, instead of responsible leading the list, we see philanthropy and environmental on top for Starbucks. And both of these scores were actually well up from 2019. And I don't think this environmental score is any surprise. Starbucks has recently done away with plastic straws for iced beverages, but it has a long history of sustainability through its supply chain and cafe practices. Starbucks is also active philanthropically through local giving and its foundation. And it's been vocal in supporting the college ambitions of its employees and supporting a more diverse workforce. So Starbucks is by no means a surprise in its strong purpose performance, but what makes uh, what this study makes clear is that it's not just us purpose insiders here that know this, but now general consumers too are really seeing it. So what you can see from these case studies is that purpose will give you that reputational advantage but you need to live your purpose internally while also telling consumers how you will integrate it into their own lives. And when you do so, it's not only that reputational advantage, but it will also turn into a bottom line benefit. So thank you for joining me as we launched our 2020 Purpose Premium Index. And with that, I am pleased to turn you back over to Sean Smith, who will moderate our panel discussion. Thank you, Andrea. Sean? And real quick before um, we do that, can you tell people how they can access additional information about uh, our Purpose Premium Index if they're interested? Why, yes, I can. So uh, shortly after this, um, you will be able to uh, find information about the Purpose Premium Index on our website. And you just head to the so research section. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Well, we may return to, uh, to, the, to the research as, as we go through our conversation, but let's, let's turn to, to Tom and Trissa. And I'll just, let's start with this moment that we are in right now, um, almost a year with COVID. Uh, racial justice, equality, a divisive presidential election. Where do you all see purpose right now, Tom, at, at John Hancock and Trissa, at the range of companies that you advise, and just in the marketplace in general? Tom, where do you, where do you see purpose at this moment in time? Well, thanks, Sean, for having me. And Tristan, great to be with you. And Andrea, Andrea will certainly learn from the report that you just covered. But I think it's critically important. And if anything, Sean, it's been accelerated by way of the events of the last eight months or so. And I think Andrea's report highlights that very well. I'd, I'd say just by way of Hancock and how we've tried to navigate uh, these challenging times. And I think just first I'll note personally that approach all of these issues with great humility and, and try to learn from stakeholders. And you know, that includes leaders within our company, from the CEO all the way down to uh, frontline employees to, to community stakeholders. So just an incredible amount of learning over the last eight months. I think it's highlighted, obviously, some of the disparities that, that our philanthropy and a lot of the work that we do on the social impact side seeks to try to rectify. And, uh, and so we've really tried to 
roll up our sleeves with our with our corporate responsibility work and and look at our our business with equity at the forefront of everything that we do and asking the question are we serving our stakeholders as uh, as well as we can possibly serve them in this environment and so if you if you take a step back our mission as a company is decisions made easier lives made better and you know that that is the thread line that runs through all of the ways in which we serve our customers our employees our investors and ultimately our community and our community specifically is facing challenges that we didn't expect obviously at the beginning of the year but they've uh, shown a spotlight spotlight on on the inequities that we're seeking to solve and if anything just going back to your 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 question it's accelerated the importance of our work more than anything else because one of our critical stakeholders is is uh being so adversely affected by events that are outside of their control and our control uh at a, at a macro level so really requiring all of us to think differently about the programs that we operate the businesses that we're running and making sure we're meeting the moment patricia tom mentioned stakeholders a few times and i'm i'm reminded of the business roundtables guidance um, about stakeholders uh, and stakeholder capitalism as opposed to serving shareholders exclusively. Is that what you're seeing right now? Is Are we seeing companies turn towards the needs of the broader stakeholders? I think in the moment of COVID, we are. Absolutely. Um, I think there's still some skepticism out there about will businesses, they've kind of said what they're going to do, will Will we see this sustained post COVID? You know, where will this go? The good news I think about politics is it doesn't change your purpose. I mean, if anything, it, you just double down on purpose because it's your North star and just keep following that North star. When I have talked to a lot of different companies about their sustainability work, that is, that's not impacted by the politics today at all. They are still marching forward with the things they have to do, including big oil companies. I mean, all of them. Um, you've seen BP just came out with a big announcement saying you know, it's going to be carbon neutral by 2050. So they are really marching forward, regardless of kind of where the world is going in, the, in these crazy times. Um, but I am seeing purpose as kind of a comfort place to go. It's where companies can really reach out to their stakeholders. Their employees matter a lot right now. And I, I do look at companies like Dell when they they had to double down to try to get products delivered so people could actually do this work from home. So school, school could occur from home. How do they get the deliveries there on time? These are their customers that need technology to just stay in business. You mentioned politics. I saw a piece today in Fast Company uh, written by, by someone who I know who encourage brands to not let up assuming we are about to enter a biden administration um, in the next few months and maybe he raised the prospects of companies using that as an excuse to kind of take their foot off the pedal to relax a little bit that the administration will rejoin the paris accord will 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 put some of these issues that have been ignored the last four years back into the public domain. Um, do you think companies are at risk of, of pulling back right now? It sounds like, Trista, you think no. I think not because uh, the driver for companies that I see are their customers. The customers are the ones saying, we, we have this expectation. So Dell, I, I, you know, as a, as a company, we feed into everybody else's numbers. They're, they're CDP, you know, if you're going to go scope one, scope two, scope three. Our customers have a lot of demands. Um, and so I don't, I don't think it'll take the foot off the pedal at all. I don't know, Tom, if you see something different. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. I think you used the right term with the North Star. I mean, if, if, if you have your, your focus on, on that bigger picture, you know, and, and most of the company, certainly John Hancock is part of Manulife, which is a global company. So the U.S. market is a really important market, but we're operating globally. So I think you know, the geopolitical issues are, are, are bigger than just the states, Sean. But I, I do think the, the heightened level of anxiety around some of those issues and social issues specifically certainly raised the, the, the expectations for us and others as an employer, for our employees looking after Kind of our values and their values. So I, I think there's no question that the last few years have amplified kind of the company voice or the need for the companies to feel like they have to have more of an external voice on some of these issues than maybe previously. 
but I, I don't think there's putting a genie back in the bottle there. I think, I think if anything, the expectations are just going to continue to rise. Tom, John Hancock is a company that's firmly rooted in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, tell us a little bit about what the company does to strengthen its relationship with, with the city and the people of Boston, even though that's not the base of your, your you know, your customer base, presumably. Um, you're obviously a big national company and, and part of a global um, operation. So, but I, I think that that your connection to the local area is strong. Can you tell us a little bit about what the company does to foster that? Yeah, maybe I'll do it, John, through the lens of our sponsorship of the Boston Marathon, because I was having this conversation with somebody the, the last time I did a work related event in the city of Boston was on March 13th. And it was to be at City Hall with our CEO to at the time. And it feels naive to think that this is what we were doing to reschedule the Boston Marathon from April to September. And the, the thought at the time was give us a few more months and we'll be able to run the marathon like normal. And of course, obviously, uh, we still sit at our homes in, in, uh, in November. So uh, it just it, it kind of harkens back to uh, really the beginning of COVID, but, but also our place in the city because the marathon, we've been a sponsor of the marathon for 30 plus years and lived through uh, you know, a, a tragedy in 2013, uh, are, are living through a real challenging year with the marathon in 2020 with COVID, but at the center of the marathon is community. And so we've built what I would uh, describe and often describe as you know, best in class sponsorship programs to benefit our community partners through the marathon. And many of them are the hospitals that, that, that are world-class institutions in the city of Boston. And so whether it was in 2013, you know, teams or like 2019, the Boston Marathon generated $38.6 million for nonprofit organizations in and around the Boston area, a record number. In 2020, despite the disruptions with COVID, it's gonna, we, we announced that it was over $32 million about a month ago. So still a lot of money raised in 2020, despite COVID. 2021, there's still a lot of uncertainty about whether there will be a race. It was just rescheduled to some point in time in the fall to give it the best chance to be run. But there is so much community uh, impact that, dri that is driven through the marathon. And then, you know, a level of pride amongst the city that, uh, that this is our marathon. And especially coming out of the devastating events of 2013, we all, I hope, saw, you know, the Boston Strong, you know, the, the creation of the One Fund. Hancock's just been a part of it. And it's a part of our community, a part of our uh, company and a part of our culture. And so there's a lot of other things, Sean, we can speak to them through, through the course of this discussion that I take great pride in that the company is involved in. But the marathon is a, is a thread line throughout all of our activities because it generates so much social impact and is tied to the governor and the mayor. And it's such a big event in the city of Boston that it's traditionally one day in April but the impact, the interactions, the intersections that we have with partners, large and small, uh, run throughout the year. And so just incredibly proud of the work we do with the marathon. And it just gives us a grounding in the city of Boston that elevates our profile locally, but arguably, um, you know, nationally and internationally by way of the, the um, nature of the race. Yeah. And and, and a lot of reputational equity um, that transcends um, the, the people of, of Boston, as, as you noted. Um, Tristan, I want to ask you, a lot of the work that you do is centers around climate and companies making an impact there. What are you seeing with respect to COVID and the intersection with climate? Has it been something that has taken the eyes off of climate for the companies you advise or, or are they leveraging this moment to shine a light on what science is telling us and the, the need to follow science um, to, to, to the climate crisis um, as we make our way through through the pandemic, are you? What are you seeing with respect to climate right now? 
Oh, that's a great question. Um, and it's, it's kind of interesting because initially, you know, there was the theory that COVID wouldn't hit the warm climate areas. So maybe climate change was good because COVID would just not show up mm. if you were hot. But obviously, I'm in Texas and we are clearly a hot spot. <laughs> it's plenty warm here. Um, so that was kind of a weird start to all of the COVID. But again, if you follow the science, um, that wasn't actually true. But I, so I do think in an odd way, it's kind of boosted the reliance on science. Um, I, I know that the country's been a little divided on some of these issues, but it, I don't think um, globally that that's really been the, the case. I think most places really are taking science very seriously. I think it will continue to be taken seriously um, in, in whatever administration come, comes next, but hopefully, you know, they'll really look at that. And the science behind climate change is significant. It's, um, that hasn't, that hasn't changed. If anything, it's just gotten a little bit, the, the need, the, the pressure's on, it's on higher than it has been. And the expectations among stakeholders continue to, to be, to be strong on climate. I mean, I, I saw in the preliminary results of the U.S. election, the, um, uh, the exit surveys where people who voted are surveyed and asked what their views are on some of the big issues. And it provides a little bit of insight into how and why the U.S. election broke the way that it did you know, every four years. Um, and that two thirds of the voters who voted in this election recognize climate as, as a serious problem that needs uh, addressing and I I can't imagine that that number has ever been higher in the U.S. Yeah, I think also the severe weather events, just in general, the United States. It's interesting if you look globally. The United States is actually hit more often than any other country with severe weather events. We we tend to we have the infrastructure generally that we don't have maybe the damage you would have on a small island, but we have the largest impact and it has impacted supply chain significantly. Over the last seven years, it's increased like 27%. So it's, it's a problem. It's for business. It's a business issue. Yeah. And businesses are moving quickly to address it. Is that is that your assessment at this point in time? Oh, absolutely. And I think where are they located and where does their supply chain go? If you're going through Miami, you're going through New Orleans, um, even Baltimore. Baltimore has sunny day flooding. It doesn't even have to rain. Uh, so does Norfolk. So you really have to be very focused on where your supply chain is and how you're going to get your product moved. Yeah. Tom, I want to turn back to Hancock for a second and ask, you know, as primarily a B2B company, um, you have recently launched a very consumer focused initiative that as I understand it, has a strong link to social impact and purpose. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and maybe explain what that is and why it's so important to, to John Hancock's work? Sure, yeah, the, the reference is to John Hancock Vitality and for everybody's benefit, John Hancock is largely known as a life insurance company. We also of another side of the business around wealth and asset management, but on the insurance side of the business as a life insurer, we've been in, insuring lives for 150 plus years in the traditional way as, as many other companies have been doing as well. Uh, but up and until a few years ago, you know, if anybody's had the pre privilege or pleasure of, of buying a life insurance product, it's, it's not all that fun, not all that easy. Uh, and the benefits of it really are just peace of mind. They're really important. And, you know, having the financial protection for you and your family are critically important are still really the foundation of the, of the product. But if you just step back and ask the question, uh, what industry should care more about your long-term care and your long-term health than the, the life insurance industry? There's, there's really not one really all that close to life insurance companies. You know, we benefit from our customers living longer, healthier lives. And so if you think about what many of us have, likely through our employers, through health insurance, kind of the incentive to nudge you for healthy behavior, those are now built into our life insurance product. And so anything that can encourage, incentivize, reward, 
uh, our customers to take steps to live healthier lives, we we try to you know encourage that on their journey. So you you buy a life insurance product. I'm a customer, so I have the benefit of kind of talking about this through firsthand experience. I'll give you one example. We have an Apple Watch program, wearing it now, and you can get a free Apple Watch essentially at the beginning of uh, your product journey. You pay twenty five dollars plus tax, so it ends up being around fifty dollars. And then you owe fifteen dollars at the beginning of every month for two years, kind of a payment plan to equate to the value of the Apple Watch. If you move over the course of those thirty days in a month or so, you're going to work that fifteen dollars down to zero. Ten thousand steps a day, going to the gym. So it, it's just this great incentive. You know, if you told me, Sean, that you were going to give me fifteen dollars if I moved a lot over the course of the month, I say, I don't really need your $15. But if, if you said that I owe you $15, if I don't do some things that would make me healthy, then I'm going to where I don't want to give you my money. And so it's just this interesting behavioral science piece to the product. But just to the point of uh, reputation and, and, and tying it to customer engagement interest, again, you go back to the typical engagement that all of us have historically had with life insurance companies. It's a bill and a privacy statement and almost no other interaction. We now, with the John Hancock Vitality Program, have 40 plus interactions with our customers weekly. An NPS score, a net promoter score, which we use as a measure of reputation, uh, you know, went from in a traditional product negative six with life insurance to a plus 40, give or take, depending on the year. So it's just totally transformed the way that we engage with our customers. And a byproduct of that is engage the way that we think about impact. And so it's not just the business over here trying to help people uh, with financial protection projects and our philanthropy over here trying to incentivize certain things within the community. It's syncing up the model that we've taken with Vitality to provide access and opportunity to our partnerships in the community and speaking through the same lens of impact that we're trying to create both for customers and community. So it's just really transformed the way that we approach uh, both customer engagement and community engagement all through the lens of trying to find behavior change, to promote healthier living. And so really exciting. It was not a corporate responsibility initiative that the business bought into. It was very much a business initiative that the corporate responsibility team has really laddered into to try to see how we can affect change in a deeper and more meaningful way in partnership with them. That's such an exciting initiative. It's it's so great. It it it's serving a lot of interests at the same time. It's a one of these win-win solutions for uh, for John Hancock, for your policyholders, and for the the health of this country. You worked in politics before your time at John Hancock. I did too. I didn't mention that in my intro. Um, I served in the Obama administration. We had a Let's Move initiative led, led by the First Lady, Michelle Obama, which, um, you know, sustained some real big impacts um, along the way that we were able to measure. But when the private sector is, is in the game too, being a force multiplier, you have the public sector and the private sector pushing towards behavior change, solving some of these big problems that are costing the country both in terms of life and health but also economically then you know the the impacts start to grow exponentially um and it's 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 true in climate it's it's true across the board of all these areas it's 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 both um heartbreaking a little bit uh from someone who served in government and in politics for so long, um, but also encouraging in, in the sense that the public's lost faith to some degree in government's ability to impact these big challenges that we face as a society, and they're applying pressure more successfully on the private sector, on companies who are seemingly more responsive right now than than some governments to to address these these issues that are affecting the society um so it's super exciting to see not just the sort of the big high level topics like like climate being addressed by companies when it's in their interest to do so but even down to some of these 
you know, sort of smaller individual habits um, that we all should be practicing, but maybe don't have the incentive until we, we run into a program like that. Um, real quick before I, I move on to, to Trissa, but I see a comment here, a question in, in the chat um, that uh, asks if the full purpose premium index report is available as well. Andrea, I think you're still on, you just went off camera. Um, we have, yeah, maybe you can speak to that. I know we have done multiple iterations of the pur purpose premium mm -hmm. index. I don't know, I know our, our earlier versions are, are available. Can you, can you talk about what is available right now? Of course. So as you said, we have been running the Purpose Premium Index since 2018. And um, shortly we will be uh, uh, launching the 2020 Purpose Premium Index on our website. So you can take um, a look for it at quarternovelli.com slash news and you will find a link to uh, all of the results that you saw today. Thank you. And also just add too that Porta Novelli has been surveying consumer perceptions on purpose um, beyond the premium index. The premium index is designed to really understand how much purpose is affecting the financial performance of, of companies. We have a, a lot of other research that shows consumer sentiment um, on this topic, consumer expectations is probably a better way of saying it, the things that they are demanding that companies do, which companies are responding to. Um, and all that's available on, on our website as well. We've been tracking consumer sentiment even during the pandemic to see if it might change along the way. Would, would, would consumer sentiment ease back a little bit um, thinking maybe that companies have more urgent needs uh, to address right now than than purpose. And, and we found that consumers have not given companies uh, slack uh, or, or, or a break from their expectations. In fact, if anything, it's increased as has been, has been said a few times. Um, Trissa, you, we, we didn't mention that you were once at Dell. You brought up Dell uh, a few minutes ago. Tell us somewhat what you, what you can about the way that you all measured um, company performance as it relates to your sustainability uh, initiatives and your corporate reputation. Because I think that there's probably some lessons in the metrics that are used to um, to quantify and track the financial re uh, performance relative to sustainability or, or purpose initiatives. Can you talk a little bit about yeah. that? Yeah, sure. So I was the former chief responsibility officer, um, very much like Tom. Tom's role was responsibility for our philanthropy and sustainability um, and employee engagement. Um, so we we used a number of different methods so there was some financial and i'll get into some of that in a minute but there were also the reputational so we did things like we would do um periodic checks on social media and where you know how were we reaching people was our message getting out and one of the things we found is that on social media for specifically twitter um the the tweets that went out that had to do with csr and purpose of the company had twice the engagement rate on the average of any other tweet that came from Dell, from anybody. And so, and I shouldn't say specifically Michael Dell, but from, from the corporate um, offices. So that was a real eye opener. The other one was in 2013, we did our soft launch of our 2020 legacy of good, which was our long-term sustainability um, plan for the, for the company. We compared that to 2015, um, and this is in media impressions, and, and we'd done a lot of work with our marketing team at the time to, to help us get the message out on what our long-term goals are and get have conversations with our customers, make sure they understood what we were doing and how it would benefit them. And our media impressions from 2013 to 2015 quadrupled. Mm -hmm. And by the way, the sentiment 
the positive. We went from 3.3 in, uh, impressions, 3.3 uh, billion to 11.8 billion in just those years. So there's pretty significant numbers in, involved that um, I, I think really help with your customer base and, and your stakeholder base there. And, and I can get into the financial now or we can save it for later. Yeah, no, please. Uh, I'm very curious to hear th that, that part. We created a dashboard for our executive team and we would have the programs that we had launched through our CSR and we would measure it across a number of factors. So CO2 savings, financial savings, and I'll give you a, a couple of examples. We had a program to go to zero waste packaging. It was one of our long-term goals. And in the process of doing that, they did things like shrink the size of the packaging, which also shrunk the cost of the shipping, et cetera. And this data was back from 2017. So from 2009 to 2017, we saved the company over $65 million just on, on packaging costs. That, that's real numbers for, for any, any business. We also were the first company to do um, the circular recycling of plastics from our recycled products and putting it back into our new products. That also had a lower CO2 footprint as well as the, in our first six months of doing it, we saved over a million dollars for the company. So there are real dollars associated with real programs that are still in existence today. And, and those, those made a difference to your CFO and your CEO. <laughs> important internal uh, stakeholders. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, and just a reminder, we have about 10, 10, 12 more minutes here. If you do have a question you want to pose to, to either the panelists or, to, or to Andrea, um, you can go into the chat function. It should be over on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, click on the chat um, tab and, and then you'll see the start typing prompt down at the bottom. Um, I might have a question for you um, on the advocacy side because that's part of your portfolio as well. And I know uh, that you guys have been involved in conversations in DC uh, and maybe in the state capitals as well um, around, I would say, non traditional topics as it relates to an insurance company. Can you can you talk a little bit about that um, and and how it became part of your overall kind of purpose engagement or social impact engagement? Yeah, if you if you think about just you know all of us assess what our company's core capabilities are, and Trista just highlighted you know the packaging example about kind of producing and then changing the way and saving money. You know, it's just that's that's not philanthropy. It's not you know, employee engagement, but it's a core to the business and looking at how you can affect change by way of your capabilities across the entire enterprise. And I think one of them, and it highlights something you mentioned earlier, Sean, just expectation around where your voice shows up and, and on what issues are you going to be uh, advocating for, whether it's a statement that you put on your website or whether you go down to Washington, D.C. And, and talk about real change. And so traditionally, not surprisingly, Hancock uses its political capital, you know, through traditional means, just around insurance and financial services issues. But uh, in the last few years, and it ties back to the Vitality product, we've gone down with uh, one of our key community partners, the Friedman School at Tufts University, Friedman School of Nutrition. Uh, their dean is just an extraordinary uh, leader, an extraordinary advocate, and he's been pushing hard for better coordination of, of nutrition across all federal agencies. And it's a conversation that's been going on for some time. And certainly anybody that's on this, uh, in this session that represents a food company is very well aware. See uh, the first lady, former first lady's initiative going back a dozen or so years, rising the profile of physical fitness and, and good nutrition, certainly in our schools and beyond. Yet there's really no coordinated across all of the federal agencies approach to nutrition. You know, there's pockets of it that exist in almost every, every federal agency. And the dean of the Tufts School actually points to, and it wasn't going to happen in this past administration, it may happen in the future one or the current one, we'll see what happens, but the future one. And uh, there, there was a, a White House conference on nutrition 50 plus years ago with President Nixon. Uh, there hasn't been one since. And so just kind of highlights the urgency. If you, if you point to a lot of the challenges that we have in healthcare, many of them are centered on, on food and nutrition. 
I mean, you, you, you get at physical activity and other things too, but really core to the issue is around nutrition. And it's a really complicated issue to unpack with a lot of interesting stakeholders that come to the table with varying solutions that, um, you know, just don't really affect our industry. You know, John Hancock comes to it um, without much baggage. You know, we're not producing food. We don't have a farm. We don't, you know, a whole lot of issues uh, that affect the, you know, the, the Nestle's who are doing extraordinary work in the space, but they're, you know, producing other things that might cause some of the challenges. So, it, you know, we've gone down to DC with, with a Dean on a few different occasions, myself and our life insurance CEOs to lend our voice to that conversation. And what the Dean has said, which I really find uh, is, a, is a good example of, of cross-sector partnerships. He says, I go down to Washington and everybody expects me to talk about nutrition. Uh, you know, the dean of the Tufts School of Nutrition. But, you know, when I go down there and I'm paired with the CEO of John Hancock, nobody really expects you to talk about nutrition. And so for our voices to be brought together is is powerful, both on the substance, but also we've used our, our government relations networks to open up doors that he otherwise probably wasn't going to get in a meeting with, with a member of Congress. So it's uh, it's definitely been something that is, I, I would say, is in our selfish interest, though, Sean. So this is not just about lending our name and lending our voice. It's going down to D.C. and creating and fostering and deepening relationships with elected officials. So who knows the next time we may call upon their office when something might might be going on. And so, Andrea, I like how you phrased it earlier, just putting, or Sean, putting kind of uh, chips in the piggy bank by way of reputation. Uh, I'll, I'll give a really quick example uh, locally in Boston that doesn't have to do with vitality and doesn't really have to do with anything by way of a specific initiative. But we were going to uh, build a building five or six years ago in Boston. My team was involved. You know, anytime you're looking to go through the permitting process with the city, it's a, it's a whole community process. And we met with a, an elected official, not in city government, but in state government about community part, you know, community leaders who are going to be a part of that process and state officials have the ability to nominate people and he said, usually I get, you know, a lot of people knocking on my door trying to be involved in these initiatives because they want to make sure things don't go sideways and their community interests are represented. But I haven't on this project. And so I called somebody and I asked them why. And they said, it's because it's John Hancock. I trust that they're going to do the right thing. And so that wasn't something that just happened over one night. It was a, a lot of different proof points over a long period of time that led to that interaction. And boy, does it feel good when it goes that way. Uh, so just another example, just in a, in a more kind of micro local way that, that speaks to the importance of advocacy, advocacy showing up and trying to do the right thing in every instance. That's outstanding. Um, Trissa, it, it feels like we are, are transitioning from a, from a period where um, people in your role, people in Tom's role may have had an uphill climb to convince leaders of the organization to embark on these kinds of things to where now their people in your roles are, are, are getting the call from, from, the, from the CEO, from the company leadership, from the board saying, can we do more? Is that, is that what you're seeing? Is, has, have we hit kind of a tipping point in that push-pull um, tension? Uh, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I took over the role back in 2010, and, and Dell had had a lot of programs in place and done a lot of work, but it wasn't front and center in the salesperson's mind. Like, how do I use the CSR team to help me do anything? And as we watched over time, the number of RFPs and then that included evaluation, not, um, not evaluation criteria, but requirements that you have in energy management systems in place and, and increasingly detailed environmental requirements in there started bringing us more into to demand. And then the, the other really super important fact was that um, particularly in some of the European countries, but in the United States as well, we're starting to see uh, your company's performance on environmental matters be a weighted criteria in the RFP. And that's when the rubber meets the road. We had a one out of France, we had a $500 million contract where um, environmental performance was over 12% of the valuation criteria. And the deciding factor, when Dell won the contract, the deciding factor in the CEO of that company told Michael Dell this was your CSR performance. Your products do pretty much the same thing the other products do, but you were far and above ahead. 
that really starts to hit the road. And then in our executive briefing center, which we're you know nice place, we bring all our customers and bring them up to speed uh, and have great conversations. There's not enough people on the team there anymore to, to attend all the briefing sessions we've been invited to. So you're definitely seeing the pull from the customers, which means you're going to see the pull from sales. Yeah, that that's that's such a terrific anecdote, and and or or. or it's a great development that 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 demonstrates how broadly the expectations have um, have distri been distributed. It's not just consumers who are out there running social media kind of campaigns to get companies to do the right thing. It's it's coming from across across the board. Are we seeing that with investors too? Can either of you speak to that stakeholder and uh, the expectations or, or the demands that are coming um, from, from that side? I'm, I'm happy to tell you. Yeah, the easy answer is yes, John. I mean, there's whether it's, you know, Manulife as an investor, you know, and, and we have an ESG team that on our public end, private markets in and built within our general account that is now integrating ESG and, and making sure that, uh, you know, that's a part of our investment analysis. And I'd say the same is true by way of investors to our business and assessing when and how they want to be making investments in, in our company and really analyzing and asking questions of us that if you, you know, look at today versus five years ago, 10 years ago, two years ago, they're, they're far more um, you know, intentional in the ESG space and, you know, the disclosures related to the space, all of that stuff uh, connects in a very meaningful way and, and it's accelerated. And uh, as, as you highlighted earlier, you know, it, it gets the attention at the highest level of the organization. And generally speaking, and this is, you know, all of us are at various points in their sustainability journey, you know, you don't want to be reacting all of the time. And, you know, that's not a good place for any of us to be. And so how do we proactively address all of the environmental, social and governance issues that our organizations deal with and have a strategy about it? And, and that's, I think, where CEO, CFO and, and certainly within our organization, we have an executive sustainability committee with, you know, a global head of sustainability and just a whole lot of infrastructure and energy um, that that is organized in a fashion that wasn't possible for us, at least in our journey, 10 years ago. And so just a, a lot of good momentum, I would say, in the space and certainly driven in large measure by investors. I'll just add real quickly, there's over $10 trillion in ESG investment today. I mean, assets that are focused on an ESG outcome, which is significant. And BlackRock, for the first time, is actually starting to use it as, you know, not a carrot, but a stick. If you're not meeting their standards, they will not continue to invest in you. So it's it's serious. 